side of America that wanted to have neutrality. And did I get you to get these down? Okay. So there is a group, there are three groups. There's one group says we want to be neutral because it's not our business and blah, blah, blah. Washington's farewell address, etc. Then there's a side that says, no, we should get involved and it should be the side of the central powers. And these are the people who, I mean, look at all of the German and Austrian and Hungarian immigrants that came, that were in America. I mean, that, that's today that's not a big percentage, but back then it was. And there are these people called Scandinavians. Does anybody know where Scandinavia is? Yes. And one more. Starts with an N. Huh? Norway. Norway. They're more German in their background, right? They don't really have as much connection to the British and French, and they certainly don't like the Russians. I'm pretty sure I said this yesterday. The Irish in America don't like Britain because the British have been lording it over the Irish for a long time. The British are taking American vessels, seizing the cargo on them, anything that's bound for Germany, because the North Sea is supposed to be a war zone. The British have this huge blockade. I'll show you the map in just a second. And any goods, any, any vessels that are going to, to trade with Germany, they, they, they stop and they, they, they steal their cargo, basically. Right? So here's the map. If you don't know, Atlantic Ocean here, England here, this is the North Sea. And if you go this way, Germany could go this way, but there's no really, there's no exit uh, up this way because it goes just straight to Russia. This is the Baltic Sea is what it's called in those countries. So, what do you call it? Dead end, basically. So this is how Germany can get out. 
and the British have it all blocked up. Right? So any American boat that goes in there, it's, it's just it's just taken. Um, now, there was a side that said, if we're going to get involved in the war, it shouldn't be on the Central Powers side. It should be on the Allies side. Because look at the trade that we have with the Allies. Look at the loans that we have to the Allies. $27 million is what Germany owed American businesses, what German businesses owed American businesses. If Germany doesn't win, how much money are Americans out? Exactly, 27 million, right? But look at how many, how many are, are uh, how much, how many loans are made to the allies. JP Morgan's bank in and of itself had $500 million loaned to British and, and, and French interests. And if they lose, we're out 2.3 billion. So you tell me, who does it pay to make sure they win? Which side is in our interest to win? Because they're going to be able to pay us back more money if they win. The Allies. Now, look, flip over on the back just for a second, just for a real quick second. Remember this yesterday? I started with this yesterday. I want you to look at this, and I'm asking you, was it a noble thing for us to get involved in the war? And if you just look at this page, what would you think? Is it more about, like, patriotism and doing the right thing and helping the oppressed and whatever of the world, or is it more about money? So there is that. I don't want to overshadow that. But that also is a pretty big deal, too, because, you know, that... 2.3 billion represents a lot of people's livelihoods over here as well, right? So, so it's not like this is cut and dry easy. It's not like with Adolf Hitler, you know, it's just really clear to see who the bad guy is, and there's no like there's, there's the, the only motive we have is just to, to get the bad guy. Right? This is very complicated, very messy. Okay, go back to the notes. Also, we have all these ancestral and cultural and historical ties to the Allies, including. Him, who was he? You should know. He was the French soldier who told him that all the last would be ready. If we didn't have the French help, odds are we wouldn't have won the war. And so literally, and she knows that from Hamilton. If you haven't seen Hamilton, then it's you're probably not, a, not an American. Um, no. It's kind of like never watching a baseball game ever. Right? You just, or never eating apple pie. You've got to watch Hamilton. Anyway, when American soldiers finally ended up getting to the war front, when they got off the boat and there's all these French people like screaming and yelling and, and celebrating, right? The American soldiers started chanting, Lost man, yeah, lost man, because we're paying them back. We're, we're, we're giving to them what they gave to us. If you were in a American school, if you've never been through the American education system at this time, there has been textbooks that stressed, you know, you were a colony of Great Britain. Our system of government is modeled after Great Britain, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, what's the main thing that we have in common with, with, with Britain? Language. The language, right? Not only do we speak the same language, mostly, although British slang is almost undecipherable sometimes. That's an example. What if I said that I just bought some jolly good things? What am I saying? Pants. Pants. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a nice house. What? I think they are Things are house. Anyway, it's a jolly good things. Look at all these pieces of literature that people read all the time. The Bible was the English, the King James Bible. Shakespeare is like monumental for the English language. Charles Dickens. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which none of you have read, but it's like the second best-selling work of literature in the history of the English language. So there's, there's all of that. Then Germany starts doing things, and we start looking at the German side of things, and we start realizing these guys aren't as good as maybe they cut off to be. First of all, they're used as the aggressor, because why? Who did they attack? Belgium. When you start the fight, usually people will not take your side. The public won't take your side. 
there had been German imperialist, imperialist policies that had kind of picked us off. Remember, we had almost fought them over Samoa, a little island out in the Pacific. Their industrial production was competing against our industrial production, and so that was annoying. What helped the public opinion as well was there were two cables that stretched from Europe to the United States, two telegraph cables that stretched from the U.S. to the United States, from the U.S. to Europe. One connected us in Germany, and one connected us in Britain. And the British, using their superior navy, cut the transatlantic cable between Germany and the U.S. Why would Britain do that? What possible reason could they have for taking it was a huge cable you know, under the ocean? Huge cable. What? Why? There's only one source of news now. And it's going to be the British perspective. Right? If not bribe, at least sway their opinion by giving them our opinion only and not the German side of things. Now, here's one way that they, you know, this was twisted a little bit. At least, I shouldn't say twisted, this is true, but you can see that it's, it's the Germans don't have their perspective taken. They're just making fun of the Germans. Remember what the Kaiser said about that treaty that he had signed without Belgium? Just a scrap of paper. Okay. And so that was used by the British and you know, caught it, taken by the Americans after that to, to make fun of the Germans, right? But some of the things that the Germans did uh, was pretty, pretty, pretty gnarly, pretty heinous. So, uh, what's a U boat? Submarine. Luther Sea Boot. My best German. Aggressive and unethical U boat warfare. I'll talk about that later. Um, you know, Canada was a part of the British Commonwealth, they were fighting over here. There was one incident, I think this, this actually happened, where the Germans not only killed the Canadian, but they, they crucified him. They literally nailed him to a barn wall or something like that, which is what I would call overkill. You know? When they went through Belgium, they mutilated women and children. There is an unwritten rule, just like a, a, a rule of gentlemen's, gentlemen's rule of warfare, is that you don't kill medics. And you definitely don't kill female nurses. And there was a, a British nurse named Edith Cavell, and she was executed by the Germans, like execution style execution. And so, you know, when we hear about these things from the British perspective and not from the German perspective, it's going to color the way we think about Germany. Now, this last one is probably not true. There's probably an exaggeration by the British press, and maybe the Belgian press as well. But, you know, when you're, when you're traveling, I mean, it's it hundreds of miles that the Germans travel to get to Paris. Um, you run out of supplies, and you need to try to figure out a way to get supplies. And so um, it was said that they took the body fat of the people that they killed in Belgium, and they rendered it into soap. Now, that's probably not true. And when I think about it, I, I wonder, like, would that work? Would your body smell better if you used human scented soap? Like, human scented because it's made of humans. And if you're washing and, and some of the soap suds get in your mouth and you swallow it, does that make you a cannibal? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how this works, right? All right, fine. But you, you get the point, right? Is the public opinion starts to sway against the Germans. Um, here's some more British propaganda. You can tell he's German because of his his uh, spiky helmet there. And she, Edith Cavell, is laying on the ground dead. There's actually a statue called Canada's Golgotha. The, what, what's the word Golgotha? Anyone? Sunday school people. It's the hill that Jesus was crucified on. Right? This is Canada's Golgotha, the statue of Canada of this commemorating that soldier. And then, of course, there is propaganda that starts to come over that, that the Americans start to, to make with all of this in mind. And you can see, this is definitely a German guerrilla pointy helmet, militarism. Culture with the K means the German way of life. 
he's destroyed, the Germans have destroyed Europe, has come, is going to come across the Atlantic Ocean to the coast. That's the propaganda that's out there. Question. What movie, what character in film history did this propaganda poster inspire? King Kong, just like not even a decade later. And you know how LeBron James um, does some controversial stuff on social media, etc. When he did this, it kind of uh, caused a stir. I'm pretty sure that is a model named Giselle, and here he is like this. And when people saw this in Vogue magazine, they said that looks too much like this, and there's all this like crazy stuff. So. LeBron at it again, right? But what about what the Germans are doing to us? That's the key that I want to get to today. That's the, the foundation of today. And this is the story of the slow inching towards war. It's slow. It's not like there's this big dramatic moment, right? So this is very boring. Okay, so here we go. Dr. Heinrich Albert was a German scientist. He was here in America. He was on an American subway, I don't know, New York, Boston, somewhere, Philadelphia, whatever. And he was, he left his briefcase on the subway. When somebody found it, and they opened it up, they found all these sabotage plans. What does sabotage mean? We're going to get you, right? We're going to go blow up American factories. This was two years before we entered the war, right? And they were successful in one of those sabotage attacks. They blew up a munitions factory, a, a weapons factory on Black Tom's Island, which is in uh, New Jersey. It's actually in the Hudson River. They used so much dynamite to blow up this factory. Across the Hudson River is New York City. It blew out some glass windows across the Hudson River, which is a pretty darn big river, right? So in, in 1960, this is a pretty big, big deal. Here's Dr. Albert. Here is Black Tom's Island. This is the shore of New Jersey. Over here is New York. And uh, just so you know, Ellis Island is actually with me right there. This is probably the one that historians focus on the most when they talk about why did we get involved in World War I. And that's unethical submarine or U-boat warfare. Okay, now, there are different rules in war when it comes to submarines. Now, some of you might say, well, Mr. Deaton, there shouldn't be any rules in war. Well, there always is. I mean, you, you say all fair in love and war, but we don't really believe that, right? We don't believe that it's fair to kill children in war, right? So here's, here's an expectation in war. Follow, follow this with me. And Brad, if you're watching, I'm doing a demonstration. Can't see it, sorry. Okay, now, this is the water. This is a British boat, this is a German boat. If they see each other on the high seas, first of all, how are they gonna know who is who? Flags. There's flags that they're flying that indicate clearly who they are, right? So that's one thing. If they're enemies, they can look at the flags through their telescopes and they can see if they want to approach or not, right? Follow me so far? Okay, so if neither of them want to fight each other, what do they do? They go the other way, right? If they want to fight each other, what do they do? They, they approach each other, right? And then they present their broadsides and they start firing. Simple, right? Like everybody knows it, it's coming. Right? Like, there's no surprise, there's no hidden element here, it's just, oh, better get ready, they're coming. And right, and if this one wants to get away and this one wants to chase, even if this one doesn't want to fight, at least they know that this one's coming to get them, right? Then they can, right? Okay, but if you take away the German boat and add a German submarine, all right, here we go. Okay. What advantage does this thing have? Surprise. Surprise, right? That surprise violates the rules of war. The British said this is not fair. Like you should have to surface the then so we can fight back, but the Germans didn't do that. Because all's fair in love and war, right? 
And so this unrestricted U-boat warfare of surprising, attacking people um, left and right was a, was a big deal. Now, at this point, the Germans were threatening our boats and the British were threatening our boats too at the same time. So they were both not wanting us to trade with either of them. And so Woodrow Wilson insists on freedom of the seas. He, he, he basically tells each side, um, we're going to stay out of it, but you all need to respect our rights. And neither of them really did. The British started, though, respecting our rights more because we started, our businesses started trading with the Allies almost exclusively by mid-1915. And the Germans were saying, no, we, we can blow up your boats, any boat bound for the United Kingdom, because of wartime necessity. It's, it's, it's a, a thing that we have to do, we need to do. And from the German perspective, I think this makes sense. And so Woodrow Wilson, wanting to keep neutral as best he can, says to especially Germany, we will hold you to strict accountability if anybody dies. Why am I saying it like that? Like, do you have a grandpa or grandma that you don't really, like if they start lecturing you, you're like, whatever, now give me a cookie. And they're like, oh, okay. Right? Some people have those kind of grandparents, right? You just don't really like respect them very much. And that's kind of how I feel Wilson feels like he, uh, that's how Wilson is right here. Like, he's saying, don't do it. And they're like, whatever. Like, what are you going to do? Right? He's trying his best to keep us out of war here. Um, but then, this boat sinks. And if you don't know any boat from World War I, this is the one you, almost everybody seems to know. Even by this point in, in your, even if you haven't had much World War One learning. Have you heard of the boat that like, is responsible for us getting involved in the war? That was from the 1600s. <laughs> USS Maine was from the Spanish American War. You're on the right track, though, yeah? Yep. Lusitania. You've never heard of Lusitania? Oh, well, now you have. Titanic was 1911. Actually, I'll just say this because Lusitania and the uh, Titanic sunk, there were like laws written during the Wilson administration to put more life rafts and more life jackets onto boats because of how many people died not being able to get off of the, the boats. Yeah. I heard that with the Titanic, they had because it didn't look good to the rich people. Yeah. Rich people. It's all the rich people. Well, in that case, it's probably good. Always the worst. In that case, it's probably good. Anyway, Lewis Kenya sinks. It's a British boat. It's headed for Ireland. And the, the Germans blow it up. And 1,200 people died, 128 of them being Americans. Now, the Germans said, we gave you fair warning because we put an ad in the newspaper letting you know that if you leave America and you're headed for Britain, you might get blown up. And, and I kind of like, I found one of these ads, right? Here is the Lusitania ad for, you know, going to, um, headed towards, and it was off the Irish coast, right? And here is the German embassy saying, you know, beware travelers because we, we might have reason to blow up non-military boats. The Germans think this is fair, but I kind of look at it as those that little fine print in those commercials for like medicine that you see on TV, right? Take this pill, it'll cure your depression. And then in the fine print, there's like 20 different ways to die. <laughs> right? Like it, it's the fine print. Nobody reads the fine print. Nobody's gonna look at page 27 of, of the newspaper and see this small little ad in the corner. Right? I mean, I guess you could say, well, it was right next to this ad, but still the point is is that they killed a lot of people that weren't. Soldiers, right? Yeah. It's not a U.S. boat. It's not. It's a British boat. But there are Americans on it. And so this is when Wilson starts to get ticked. And he sternly demands that Germans pay reparations. They didn't. 
But notice, he still tries to keep America to remain neutral. He's trying to sit the fence. He's trying to keep us out of war, but also, you know, wag his finger at the Germans, right? Now, just to show you how divided we are still, there's two other politicians that have other ideas here. Now, how do you think, knowing what you know about Teddy Roosevelt, how do you think Roosevelt reacted to the Lewis Kingdom? He wants to fight, right? He is so ticked off that he basically calls Wilson a coward. No, he doesn't basically call He does call him a coward. On the other side, though, of Teddy Roosevelt, on the other side of Wilson, who's in the middle, there is William Jennings Bryan, who is a pacifist. Remember, he's lost the presidential election three times. He's now Secretary of State. And um, he actually, it shouldn't say objects. Well, here's Teddy Roosevelt making a speech. You can see here he's got soldiers to protect him after that assassination attempt like three years earlier. And it shouldn't say object, it should say resigned. He resigned as Secretary of State because Wilson worded his messages too strongly to Germany. He's such a pacifist. So even in these three people, you can see how divided the American people are. It's just a, 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 it's a symbolic of that. And what Wilson starts to do, even though he wants us to be neutral, is he starts to build up the military. He sees that there is a reason to build up the military. And I don't want to overemphasize this, but I don't want you to be naive either. They were rich people in America who were patriotic and wanted to protect us and so on and so forth. But they also saw that there's an economic upside to war, that you can make money off of war. These were bankers and they were factory owners and they got together and they called themselves the National Security League. And they started pressuring Congress to get us involved in building up our military. The propaganda about the Lusitania, you should enlist in the U.S. Army because this will happen if you don't. It's kind of like, remember the Maine, remember the Lusitania. Then the Germans sunk another, um, I think this was a British boat, too, called the Arabic. Two Americans were on it that died. And so the Germans realized we're getting too close to war with the, the Americans. And so they issued what was called the Arabic Pledge, where they said, We'll give, we'll, we'll surface, and we'll give that vessel 30 minutes before we blow them up. 30 minute one. Happy now, Americans? Apparently not, because um, when the Sussex, which I think was a, either a French or a Belgian boat, blew up, several Americans were injured because they didn't get off, they weren't far enough away from the boat in time, you know, after the 30 minutes. The Germans said, okay, fine, here's what we'll do we'll surface. We'll get everybody off, we'll search the boat, then we'll blow it up, but we'll ensure everybody's safety. So they're, they're restricting their U-boat warfare. You think that's silly? Yeah. <laughs> Grant thinks a lot of things are silly. And it is, right? It's, 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 it's kind of ridiculous. And, and you'll see, they'll, they'll stop it in a minute. Do you remember how big was our Navy, our rank in the world, our third largest Navy? Britain? Germany, us. So we're prepared here, but what about our army? You're giving us too much credit. It's the 15th largest army in the world. We are not ready to fight the German war machine on land. And so, and I don't want to overemphasize this too much because I believe Wilson was a patriot and had America's best interests at heart, but also you'd be naive to think that there wasn't a political advantage for him to build the military because there was an election in 1916. The same time as this stuff is going on. And we can get votes by building up the military. So the National Defense Act of 1916 increases the size of the army and the National Guard. And it's because of this law that the National Guard now can be used to be. They were part of just this protecting the state that they were in, and now they can be called up to fight if they need to be. And the Naval Construction Act also authorized more battleships to be built, and so Wilson is starting to prepare us for war. Just in case. He's not threatening to get in war, he's just preparing us. Now, this brings me to the election of 1916, because it, 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 it's key, right? You've got two different political parties who might have different views on the war. And so whoever people vote for is probably what they're thinking about the war, right? 
So you have Woodrow Wilson, who says, I don't want to be involved in war. The Republicans, who had been splintered under Taft and Roosevelt, are now reunited, and they've gotten together, and they've voted in progressive New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes. Charles Evans Hughes was a flip-flopper in the pro-war parts of the country who would talk about war and in the anti-war parts of the country who wouldn't talk about war. Right? He made a big mistake by not going to personally greet the progressive governor of California, Hiram Johnson. And that might have cost him votes, which might have cost him California. And that's why he eventually lost. But the most important thing you need to know about him is that luscious beard. Look at that. Is that random enough for you? Look at that beard. That is awe-inspiring. I could never grow a beard that thick. Christian Swincher asked me about security. Can you even grow a beard? Like, of course I have. I've already grown a beard this, this year once. He challenged me to do it. So I guess you might be seeing me try to grow a beard. Next to I can't get that. I don't think I want to. That would be too, that'd be too hot. Okay. Enough about his beard. Wilson said his slogan was, the Democrats' slogan was, he kept us out of war. That he kept, you can see here, America first. Under Wilson, we'll get prosperity, we'll be prepared in case we're attacked, but we also will have peace with honor. And so this is his main slogan, he kept us out of war. What would you expect then if he gets elected? He's going to keep us out of war, okay? Teddy Roosevelt is going around the country, and he is supposed to be campaigning for the Republicans because he's a Republican. But basically, what he's campaigning for is war, and he ends up like kind of like Donald Trump, like trashing the people in his own party. He basically tells the country that Charles Evans Hughes is just as much of a coward as Wilson. There's really no difference between the two, but the only difference is a shade that he's a whiskered Wilson. Now, for the most part, the parts of the country that wanted war voted for the Republicans. The parts of the country that did not want war voted for Wilson. And Wilson actually goes to bed the night of the election thinking that he had lost, but he didn't even win his home state of New Jersey. If you don't win your home state, that's a bad sign. But because the West returns came in later, they don't want war. That makes sense, right? Because all the U-boats being blown up are like 2,000 miles away. Europe is like 8,000 miles away from them. The South always votes with Democrats. And so he was able to win with these electoral votes right here. The parts of the country where there's industrialists and bankers and so on, they voted for war, and Wilson ends up winning. And even though he says he's going to keep us out of war, later. He did just flip. What's that? Wilson, no, the South always went. Uh, arbitrarily, 19. Was it Richard Nixon? He said Republicans going to start winning the South. And he started winning the South. More on that later. Circumstances will change this. Do you know that the circumstance that pushes us towards war? Ding, ding, ding. Zimmerman note. The British intercept a telegram that's being sent from Germany to Mexico. And they present it to Woodrow Wilson and lay on his desk. And we call it the Zimmerman note because that's the code name of the person who wrote it. I want you to remember that conflict of Pancho Villa down in Mexico going on, going on at this time. And here's what the Zimmerman note said. This is from Germany, remember. When it says we, they're talking about Germany. On the 1st of February, we intend to begin unrestricted submarine warfare. We're going to stop those restrictions of having the silly restrictions of having to we're going to get off the boat and blow it up on the island, right? In spite of this, it's our endeavor to keep the United States American neutral. They don't believe that we can keep America neutral. I know this because of the next line. In the event of this not succeeding, we propose an alliance on the following basis with Mexico, that we shall make war together and peace together. We shall give generous financial support to Mexico, give money to Mexico. 
with the understanding that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. That part of America that we had gotten from Mexico like 70 years before this in the Mexican War, that Mexico is supposed to do what? Invade America and take it back. And not only that, they like, we want to invite Japan into this whole thing too, because what did we have that Japan wanted? Hawaii, right? Now, this is the, the, the signed Zimmerman down there. You've got a copy of it at the bottom of your page. When Woodrow Wilson approached Mexico and said, what gives here? And Mexico like, well, we don't have anything to do with it. So we didn't go fight them. But this showed us that Germany is the bad guy. And so Wilson took all of our ambassadors away from Germany, kicked their ambassadors out of the country. That's the first step towards war. They blew up five more American ships after that. And then, I don't want to underemphasize this. This was important. The Russian Revolution had two steps. The second one was when Lenin came and made them a, a dictatorship of communism. The first step was when they overthrew the Tsar and they set up a democracy. So now Wilson can say, this is a war between democracy and monarchy. This is a war between the free peoples of the world and the peoples who are oppressed by their kings. And in fact, in his war speech that he makes in April of 1917, he says, I want to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, peace without victory, we can go over that later, we don't have time. Uh, but in his war message, he, he says to the people, does everyone know that's why we're fighting? We're fighting because of the U-boat attacks, our investments with the Allies, and our cultural ties with the Allies. Here's why we were badly needed. When we actually ended up sending troops, the Europeans were exhausted in the trenches. And the Americans came over and had this lion's head. Let's go beat them, right? You know, Captain America kind of cocky attitude. And then, of course, Russia left in 1918. And so we were desperately needed because of that. I dare say, if we had not won, uh, entered the war and Russia had left, then Germany would have won, I, I, I believe that. And literally, it seems like overnight, for some people in America, it seems like overnight, the song was changed. And the attitude went from, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier, to I didn't raise my boy to be a slacker. Okay, now... There is a huge assignment tomorrow, an absolutely huge assignment tomorrow. You need to bring your notes tomorrow. You need to bring your notes tomorrow. If you want to practice, I have put up a quiz is right here. This is not required. You can still do very well on the, the assignment tomorrow. And in fact, I believe I'm going to let you have partners for this. But this is a way to practice just in case. Big assignment. Uh, 100 formative points tomorrow assignment is what I mean by big. Formative. So are you good? Do you have any questions? You want to ask some good questions?